Now, it is my great pleasure to ask our first speaker, the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ine Eriksen Sørede, to enter the podium and officially open the 54th Leoncon Security Conference. Please, Minister, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Rose, Anne-Grete, Kate. This is the 54th Leoncon Conference, and uh, somehow I feel that I've been here for the past 50 of them, more or less. <laughs> That's maybe not completely accurate, but it feels like it. And that is because this has become an institution, and it's exactly right, uh, as both Kate and Anne-Grete mentioned, that this is actually the place to be when February starts uh, and security policy is on the agenda. I think we have discussed several times before in this forum that international law is our first line of defense. But how effective would that line of defense be without the institutions and the practices that make up our security architectures? Institutions such as NATO, the EU, the OSCE, the Council of Europe. Last year, we commemorated the end of World War I a war of immense and unspeakable human suffering. Interestingly, though, the period before the war began was a rich era in European history, an era that even bears some resemblance to our world today. A period when, at least for a long time, economic liberalism thrived, a period of growth and innovation, a period of technological breakthroughs that connected the world in new ways, a period of advances in international law, and last but not least, a period when alliances was formed. But the security architecture of 1914 was, not, was also mired by weaknesses and ambiguities that amplified distrust, fueled escalation, and led to war. The experiences from this era and the interwar period provide a useful vantage point for the topic that we are to discuss today. They remind us how subtle the differences between success and disaster can be, and how finely tuned our security architecture must be in order to be both effective and sustainable. The system we have built in Europe since 1945 is unique in that sense a system that is built on the ruins of two devastating world wars. It certainly has ensured security and stability, but in contrast to other ways of organizing international relations, it has also produced prosperity, liberty and democracy. And it has given small states a say in international affairs that they rarely have had in European history. So when our security architecture is under pressure, much more is at stake than security and stability alone. And when we address these challenges, the devil is in the details. Moral arguments are not enough. We have to come up with concrete solutions, both abroad and at home. Transatlantic relations is at the heart of this conference. A strong transatlantic bond is essential to our security architecture. It's one of the main factors that separates the current order from previous failures. Yes, the US certainly also engaged in Europe before 1945, but temporarily and mostly to solve and deal with crisis. The long-term effort that started in 1945 and endures to this day has been crucial in making Europe pull in the same direction, in ensuring the participation of other great powers and in creating a level playing field. Another critical factor very much linked to US leadership has been our ability to adapt. Historically, changes in the European security architecture have followed in the wake of war. The current architecture, however, has to a great extent also evolved in peacetime in response to specific challenges that arose in the 20th century, such as the risk of Soviet aggression, or nuclear attacks and proliferation, and of uncontrolled armament, or 
the risks posed by new technology, by misunderstanding, as well as emerging new threats such as terrorism. Last but not least, the architecture has also evolved as a result of positive aspirations. Our aspirations to build trust and confidence, to reconcile countries, and to manage and prevent conflicts. And to build a democratic Europe, whole, free, and at peace, to use the word of the late President Bush. It would not have been possible without the visionary generation of Europeans, including the likes of Schumann, Monet, and Adenauer, who saw the potential of European integration as a means of building peace in Europe. The result is an architecture that strikes a delicate balance between different and sometimes opposing concerns. Between defense and deterrence on the one hand, and confidence building on the other hand. Between idealism and realism. Between a Europe of nations and a Europe of great powers. Between institutional approaches and bilateral solutions. So what are the main challenges to security architecture in Europe today? I see at least five challenges that distinguish the current era from previous periods. I think, could I have a little bit glass of water? Because I think my <clears throat> throat is getting, <clears throat> and, I'm, and I'm only getting started, so you can just imagine. <laughs> Thank you. So, the first challenge is uncertainty about future U.S. leadership in Europe and great power participation. I want to start out by saying that on many scores, the record is very positive. The U.S. has strengthened its presence in Europe, spearheaded important reforms in NATO, and mobilized allies to spend more on defense. We are seeing a U.S. that is committed to the full spectrum of allied missions and operations. A U.S. that last year, during the Trident Juncture exercise here in Norway, participated with more personnel and equipment than it has done for years. And I see and I experience a remarkable continuity in the practical security policy, despite what you would think if you only read Twitter feeds. However, we're also seeing a U.S. that questions international cooperation on a more fundamental level a U.S. that has pulled out of certain international institutions and agreements, that occasionally questions key institutions and alliances, and that increasingly treats international relations and at times even strategic matters in transactional terms. Such developments are a so source of concern. On a theoretical level, one can entertain ideas of other ways of organizing European security, including visions of strategic autonomy, a European army, or a Nordic defense union. For that matter, such ideas have been around since the 50s. The fact of the matter, though, is that no country and no arrangement can replace the U.S. in Europe. U.S. military power is unparalleled, and in addition, no other country has the same political determination and power to make countries rally around common values and pull in the same direction. The U.S. fostered the European security architecture, and for better or worse, it remains vital in upholding it. But we also need to keep other powers engaged, including Russia. Russia's violation of international law and the shrinking democratic space inside Russia are serious reasons for concern. And short-term gains from pulling out of structured international cooperation have always been a temptation for great powers. In the long term, however, a Europe without a strong NATO, OSCE, and a Council of Europe is hardly a good place for anyone. For small countries like Norway, we would see our security and our role in the world diminished. For the US, it would potentially mean having to deal with new crises in Europe. For Russia, it would possibly mean having to deal with an arms race that would surpass its means. Indeed, the lessons of two world wars and the interwar period is that we need strong institutions 
and that they are only strong if we manage to keep the powers on board. The League of Nations did not fail because of insufficient regulation or faltering ideas. It failed primarily because of lack of great power commitment. If great powers are not on board, our efforts will be at best ineffective, at worst counterproductive. My second concern is the scale and extent of challenges to the security architecture. Our architecture has always evolved in response to the security climate. Even in difficult periods, we've been able to move forward, at least in some areas. To today, though, we seem to have challenges in several areas, and they come at the same time. In terms of international law, with Russia's annexation of Crimea and the ongoing war in Ukraine, in terms of basic principles, with Russia's emphasis on the old-fashioned concept of spheres of influence, a concept reminiscent of the security architectures of the 19th century, perhaps stable under certain conditions, but in most cases at the expense of liberty, prosperity, and sovereignty. Furthermore, we barely have a functional conventional arms regime. The INF Treaty is failing due to repeated Russian violations. The future of New START may seem uncertain, and the Vienna document is undermined by creative ways of staging and counting exercises. And I could go on. NATO is materially stronger than before, but the internal cohesion is under pressure, and the issue of burden sharing is one of several challenges that can drive us further apart if we do not resolve them in time. My third concern is the pace of technological changes. The erosion of our security architecture happens in a period that has been labeled the fourth industrial revolution. A time with tremendous advan advances in cyber capabilities, artificial intelligence, missile technology, autonomous ve weapons, and such developments may lead to changes in power distribution. And they have already affected the way many countries are thinking about defense and deterrence. Our security architecture has always been able to respond to such challenges. Today, however, we are caught up in an effort to save existing structures, and that leaves little room for foresight and for addressing new strategic challenges. My fourth concern is growing fragmentation. In recent year, years, we've seen an impressive development of defense cooperation in smaller groups. The combination of financial constraints and growing security needs have drawn us all together in new ways. In principle, this is a positive development, and Norway supports it and has taken part and is taking part in several <coughs> initiatives. Not only does it, at best, save money, it creates a solidarity that not only relies on treaty obligations or common values, it creates a level of integration of military value chains that make collective defense unavoidable in the event of an attack. However, all of this requires a strong alliance. Under a more fragmented security order, interdependence can produce very different results. In fact, conflicts can escalate in new and unpredictable ways. In 1914, complex military and political affiliations contributing, contributed to setting Europe ablaze, although the initial spark happened in a small country on the outskirts of Europe. My fifth concern is the growing pressure on democracy itself. The success of our alliance has not only been its ability to provide peace and stability, but also liberty, prosperity, and democracy. All these factors are interlinked and mutually sustaining. Freedom in Europe would not have survived the 50s and the 60s without the protection of the US. The EU could not have developed without NATO. NATO would not have flourished without the prosperity brought by European integration. And our democratic aspirations would not have been successful and not have been as successful as they have been without institutions such as the Council of Europe. 
Today, the very type of cooperation that brought forth these institutions is under pressure, not only by flawed democracies, but even some in NATO and EU member states. So how do we preserve the, preserve the security architecture in the face of such immense challenges? I would, of course, not leave you with five challenges and no solutions, so I am going to offer three suggestions for the way forward. First, we need to keep all the great powers in, and above all, the U.S. The U.S. is the best bulwark against fragmentation and multipolarity in Europe, and it remains the sole guarantor of a level Russian-European playing field. Keeping all member states in requires something that I discussed at length last year when we met for this conference, namely allied patience. We may not agree on all issues, but we have to work together to mobilize the same sort of pragmatism that made the Alliance navigate through difficult waters in the past. Moral indignation dominates much of the public discourse between Europe and the US these days. Focusing on concrete results is often a more constructive path forward. A strong and stable Europe is also very much in the self-interest of the US. Europe is the largest, largest export market for the US. A stable, friendly Europe allows the US to engage more in other regions, such as the Asia-Pacific region. A stable Europe has institutions and agreements that stand in the way of an arms race that would be vastly more expensive in the current climate of technological change than in previous periods. Avoiding an arms race is not only in the US interest, it's also in Russia's interest. The economic burden of the Cold War arms race were among the factors that brought down the Soviet Union. And indeed, military spending has bearing on other public services, like pensions, like social security, infrastructure and development. And last year's discussions on pensions reform in Russia was a stark reminder of how sensitive these issues are also with the Russian public. Second, we have to meet the challenges with reform and with engagement. That has always been part of our answer. We do not dispose of our architecture. We keep it and we reform it. Our institutions are only as strong as we make them. And that is why reform will be high on our agenda if we are elected uh, a non-permanent seat to the Security Council. And that is also why the government is right now preparing a white paper on reforming and upholding the multilateral system and cooperation. Norway has often been at the forefront of reforms in NATO. From the 60s, when we made the case for strengthening NATO's civilian profile, and up to recent years, when we have called for reforms of the command structure to better deal with challenges in NATO's core areas. The reforms since Wales, including the latest establishment of a maritime and logistics command, are important steps in ensuring that NATO remains fit for purpose. These reforms have in part both been initiated by and driven by Norway. But the single most important deliverable to keep the US engaged in the short term is burden sharing. And burden sharing, my friends, is not a minor issue. Meeting the targets will take time, but allied patience has to be a two-way street in this area as well. While we've not reached the objectives yet, years of cuts have been turned into solid growth. Today, all NATO members are beefing up their budgets. Indeed, between 2015 and 2017, the combined increases in Allied spending amounted to almost the size of the whole military budget of Russia. Norway has increased its defense spending by 30% in real terms since 2013. We are well above the 20% investment pledge, currently at about 27% and increasing. With the, new, uh, the next long-term defense plan, the aim is to move even further towards the 2% target. In the face of pressure against NATO, we are not abandoning the ship by nationalizing our capabilities. We are investing even more in capabilities that will strengthen the alliance as a whole. That is high-end strategic capabilities that are deployable and interoperable, such as submarines, 
F-35s, P-8s, Intel capabilities, and Army assets, just to mention a few. We follow the same approach in other areas. In a challenging time for Europe, we are continuing to meet our political and financial obligations in the OSE and in the Council of Europe. Both these organizations are highly challenged at the current political developments. Norwegian financial contributions to the OEC and its institutions have increased significantly over the last couple of years with an aim to strengthen the OEC's impact in terms of conflict prevention and capacity building, especially demo uh, democratization in the East. And third, we have to bilateralize in a wise manner. Cooperation in groups of two or more countries can strengthen the security architecture in Europe, but it can also weaken it. A complex web of formats like the one we have in Europe today is only viable if it builds on strong transatlantic bonds. At the beginning of my presentation, I said that if you leave the US out of the European equation, you are left with a Europe without sufficient collective defense. Likewise, if you leave NATO out of the equation, you are left with a fragmented Europe. In a time of scarce resources, transatlantic friction, and the emergence of new defense initiatives, we should not underestimate the risk of fragmentation. We have to make sure that whatever we do in, or in other settings, be it Nordefco, PESCO, EDF, European Intervention Initiative, it does not undermine but strengthen NATO. Duplication and uncertainty is not the way forward. Norway will continue to engage with the European Union and cooperation in Europe. We intend to take part in the European Intervention Initiative. We're also assessing whether and how Norway can take part in new EU initiatives such as the European Defence Fund and PESCO. We do it be because we believe it can reinforce the existing European security architecture, not undermine it. We do not believe in a new security architecture. We believe in a reformed one. Finally, dear friends, in exactly 60 days, on the 4th of April, I will be in Washington, D.C. And together with other foreign ministers of the Alliance, we will celebrate the 70-year anniversary of the organization. And in 55 days, the U.K. is scheduled to leave the EU. So, two different things there. In 1949, the founding members of NATO promised not only to defend each other, but also to defend the values that we share. Our alliance has stood the test of time because we have been able to adapt to new challenges. Our alliance has stood the test of time because each of us has built societies that value and uphold the solidarity and shared responsibility that this alliance was founded on. And our alliance has stood the test of time because the bonds that bind us together are strong. We have seen challenging times before, and we have overcome those challenges. I'm equally sure that we will overcome the challenges that we see currently. Thank you.